it's Kathy Cassidy and I am here again today to read you a chapter of Scarlet. I hope your day has been okay so far and that you're coping all right. I am talking to you again from my workshop with a lot of my craft bits and pieces behind me and the door's half open because it's not really cold or anything but it is blowing a gale today so if we have any strange sound effects that will be the reason why. Um, I had a couple of shout outs to do today. Um, I, I think a couple, of, a couple of chapters ago I asked people to let me know where they were watching and listening, what they were doing when they watched and listened. I had a couple of really lovely replies. Um, one was from Jade in her turquoise kitchen living room in Surrey who listens along every day with a frothy soya coffee, which sounds totally up my street. I like the sound of that. And the other one that really made me smile was from Amelie, who listens snuggled up with her mom at seven o'clock every evening. And she absolutely made my day by saying that it's her favorite bit of lockdown, which just makes, you know, just makes everything worthwhile. Thank you, Amelie, you are a star. Um, also, a quick thank you to Sophia and Ella, who both sent me amazing poetry to put on the Dreamcatcher reader blog. And um, they're both readers that I've only got to know through the YouTube, so that is fantastic. Um, and last but not least, just a short, a short shout out to um, some friends that I know are listening along as well. And that is for Doreen, for Helen... Sheena, Jan, Hill and Craig, for Lal, for Di, for Nat and Francesca. So um, let's get on with the story. We're on chapter 13. Okay, and if you remember from yesterday, Scarlet has been out all night on an adventure with the mysterious boy from the loch. Um, and yeah, we'll find out what happens the next day. I creep under the covers at dawn, feeling warm and shivery and full of hope. I can't stop smiling because I've never known a boy like Kian before. A boy who makes me feel safe and special. A boy who wants me to stick around. I don't know much about him. I don't know his surname, his age, his address or phone number. I don't know the name of his favourite band, his hopes, his dreams, his likes, dislikes. I don't know if any of that matters. I'm falling for him anyway. I've, I know that Kian is a bad news boy. Anybody who calls for you at midnight with a handful of gravel is unlikely to be a boy scout. Mum and Dad and Claire would not approve, but then I don't approve of them either. So what does it matter? I close my eyes and my head fills with pictures of a black-haired boy with sun-brown skin, a boy who laughs easily, talks softly. I can see the sunrise painting the water silver, see a big black horse wading out into the water to drink. It happened and it was magic. It was mine. I can hear people moving about downstairs, laughing, talking. Sunshine peers through the crack in my curtains, warming my face and arms. And there's a gorgeous cooked breakfast smell in the air. I rub my eyes. Scarlet, breakfast ready, Dad shouts up. Don't let it go cold. I roll over, burrowing down beneath the quilt. I don't do family breakfasts, especially not in this kind of patched up excuse for a family. But isn't it a waste of sunshine to lie in bed all day? I wash quickly, drag on some clothes and hobble downstairs. In the kitchen, Dad is frying eggy bread like he used to do when I was little. And Claire is dishing out baked beans, grilled mushrooms, tomatoes, fried onions, potato cakes. There is not a sausage or a bit of bacon in sight. And my mouth twitches into a smile before I can help it. It's a vegetarian brunch and it looks fantastic. We're eating outside, Claire says. Go on and sit down. I mooch out into the garden where Holly is setting the table with the red spotted cloth and pouring orange juice into glasses. I look around for evidence of Kian and Midnight, but there's nothing. It's like last night, never happened. 
Dad and Claire come out carrying mismatched china plates laden with food. French toast, Holly exclaims. Yum! Eggy bread, we used to call it, Dad says, trying to catch my eye. It was your favourite, Scarlet, remember? Think you're mixing me up with someone else, I say coldly. Does he think he can buy me with a cooked breakfast and a shared memory? Well, it's definitely my favourite, Holly says cheerfully. From now on, anyway, I think I might go vegetarian like Scarlet. I wouldn't miss me except for sausages and you can get ones made out of tofu or something, can't you? Do smoky bacon crisps count? Let's not do anything hasty, Dad frowns. Why not, I chip in, just to bug him. If Holly wants to give up, I'd say the sooner the better. The average person eats over a thousand chickens, 23 lambs, 18 pigs and four cows in a lifetime. Think of the lives she'd been be saving, Holly. Right, says Holly, looking slightly alarmed. And do crisps count, did you say? Absolutely, I say with conviction, everything counts. I spot a couple of chickens scratching about under the table for scraps. Why would anyone want to eat these little guys? I don't, Holly decides. I won't. I'm going to do it. Go veggie. Will you help me? Of course I will, I tell her, and I'm rewarded with the kind of bright-eyed, adoring look I've only ever seen on spaniels before. It'll be cool. You won't regret it, Holly. But Dad and Claire will, and that, of course, is half the fun. Dad scoffs the last of the eggy bread, eating it spread with strawberry jam the way we used to. Jam, says Claire. Disgusting. You'd be surprised, Dad grins, winking at me. Holly rinses the empty jam jar with the garden hose and wafts around the garden, picking flowers to arrange in it. She has some seriously sad habits. Mum, she calls up from the end of the garden. Something funny's happened to the flower bed. Everybody wanders down to take a look. The flower bed is full of crater-like holes where midnight's hooves sank into the soft soil last night. And the flowers are either eaten or trampled. It looks like a small herd of elephants has been to visit. What on earth, Dad exclaims, baffled. I could tell them all about the carnage, of course, but would they believe me? No. Would they blame me? Yes. I told you to fix that broken bit of wall down by the workshop, Claire huffs. Something's been in here. Cattle or deer or something. A horse, I chip in helpfully. Don't be silly, Scarlet Dad says. There are no horses nearby. It'll be deer. I don't care if it was wolves or wild boar, Claire grumbles. It's ruined my garden. Get that wall fixed, Chris, today. Dad sighs and I remember that DIY was never his strong point. I think of the pine shelves that he put up in the kitchen in Islington. He huffed and grumbled all afternoon, making me hold the spirit level and find the right roll plugs. And after all that, Mum still said it was wonky. It didn't look so bad once we'd camouflaged it with pretty plates and dishes, though. And then, at half past two in the morning, the whole shelf collapsed and every single plate was smashed to pieces. I remember the three of us standing there in pyjamas, surrounded by broken cups and dishes and serving bowls, laughing till the tears ran down our cheeks. Don't worry about it, Dad says now. I'll get it sorted, Claire. It's all dry stonework, isn't it? How hard can it be? He looks at me and catches the glint in my eye. Don't, Scarlet, he whispers. Don't say a word. And somehow, both of us are smiling. So that's the end of chapter 13. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to tune in again tomorrow and find out what happens next. Is Scarlet starting to soften towards her dad? Not sure, not sure if she is just yet, but we'll have to wait and see. I hope you are all coping okay. I hope that you're all finding something interesting and cool to do during lockdown and uh, making sure that you let the people you care about know that you're thinking of them too. 
I will see you again tomorrow for another chapter. Take care.